Tonight, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Tonight is class 11 of our Orthodox Survival Course. You might say the first part of our course was the most enjoyable part uh, because it was like eating dessert before dinner because we, we talked about what orthodoxy is. That was very uplifting and enjoyable. Now we're going to talk about how the West fell away from orthodoxy. and So a lot of this is going to be very sad and uh, not so enjoyable, but it's work that has to be done. That's why we're here. It's like if, if you go to the doctor, you want to hear the diagnosis. You don't want to hear just, uh, you don't want him to cover up the bad news. So we, we know there was bad news. We know that the West fell away from orthodoxy, fell away from the church. And we want to examine why and how that happened. And we have to start with the period where it happened. Now, again, um, I'm assuming that most of us know the data of the history. We know about the, the, the schism. And we know about the two fundamental dogmatic issues that separated East and West, which were the filioque, or in the creed, or the change of the creed, and the, the papacy. We're not here tonight to just to go over that history, which I assume that we know, but to talk about the entire change in the mindset and the change in the culture in Western Europe that occurred during this period. <clears throat> to understand what kind of people these became, what kind of a religion this became, what kind of a mindset this became. Because really there's an underlying mindset, an underlying way of uh, understanding theology, an underlying way of understanding art, an underlying way of understanding man's relation with God, the spiritual life, that is much bigger than just specific problems like filioque or papacy. And that's what we're here to understand. That's what Father Seraphim's course was really about. And tonight we're going to actually start using and quoting from Father Seraphim's lectures. We're into the part of the course now where actually uh, we can use his lectures. And I'm going to be quoting from them. If any, uh, perhaps some of us still don't have this text, I'll, I'll once more, I'll, when I send out the notes to tonight's class, I'll, I'll resend the PDF or the link to the PDF of Father Seraph, the uh, transcript of Father Seraphim's lectures. So we're going to, lecture two is on the Middle Ages. In many ways, this is the most important lecture because this is the point at which things really changed. I can only partially cover this tonight, but I hope that tonight we can get some, a strong understanding of some fundamental changes that took place. I'm once again going to read this quote from Yves Congar that we read toward the beginning of our course. This is quoted by Father Seraphim in uh, the introductory material to the Vita Patrum of St. Gregory of Tours, which he translated years ago, which is, but was finally published in 1988. Congar says, a Western Christian of the 4th or 5th century would have felt less bewildered by the forms of piety current in the 11th century than his counterpart of the 11th century in the forms of the 12th. In other words, a huge transition took place in the 12th century, in the 1100s, right after the schism, right after the schism was made final, right in, in uh, 1053. The great break occurred in the transition period from the one to the other century. This change took place only in the West. Now, this is a Westerner writing this. It's a Dominican. This change took place only in the West, where sometime between the end of the 11th and the end of the 12th century, everything was somehow transformed. This profound alteration of view did not take place in the East, where in some respects, Christian manners are still today where they were then. As he has a Roman Catholic author admitting that the Orthodox are still the same, right, as in the 4th and 5th century. And what they were in the West before the end of the 11th century, that's Yves Congar, uh, the Dominican, a book after 900 years, which is a book that he wrote in reference to the uh, ecumenical dialogue between East and West, published back in 1959. Now again, to repeat uh, an earlier comment I've made, Yves Congar is not an Orthodox theologian. He's not even really a Roman Catholic theologian. He's a modernist Roman Catholic theologian. And people like Yves Congar, uh, the Roman Catholics who actually laid the foundation for their Second Vatican Council were very good scholars. These men were in, in, very intelligent. They were highly learned. And they accurately diagnosed how the West left orthodoxy during the Middle Ages. But they used their critique not to encourage their brethren to return to orthodoxy or to repent, return to orthodoxy, but simply as an excuse to destroy the church they had, and to create their new modernistic church. Okay. Now, our modernist Orthodox theologians do the same thing. 
they'll go back and say, well, you know, this change took place. Uh, we made this mistake back in 1321 or whatever. Therefore, then they use that as an excuse to destroy the organically received tradition. Okay? So I'm not quoting Congar because he's some holy man who's a personal uh, example we can follow, but because he was a, a, a very excellent scholar who correctly diagnosed, is diagnosing what happened in the 12th century. And as we go through our course, as I've said, I will be using non-Orthodox scholars who present the data, right? who present what happened so that we can learn from it. But of course, we have to give our Orthodox interpretation to it, because that's the true interpretation. So the true interpretation uh, is that is that because they broke right with the with the body of the church in in 1054 uh, when the split between Constantinople and Rome took place and that they wouldn't repent and the schism became final they went off into wrong paths right they went off the grace departed and the, they break with holy tradition and they went off into into wrong paths so now we're we're now beginning part two of our course and we hope to trace the development of Western European thought and culture from the time in which the Western Church left the unity of orthodoxy until now, till the 21st century. So this is going, necessarily, it's going to be predominantly a sad story. You might say the first part of our course is the enjoyable part, where we reviewed what orthodoxy is. Now we're going to do the hard work of understanding what orthodoxy is not, and how the subtle change, and it was a subtle change at first, right, from orthodoxy to what can be called papism or Latinism, in the 12th and 13th centuries began a process that eventually became an avalanche of change. Right? It snowballed. It became worse every century. Right? That led to the drastic secularism and apostasy of today, today's so-called post-Christian age. Right? Monk has summarized the entire process by saying that at the beginning, Western European Christians made a subtle shift right, from trusting in holy tradition to trusting in reason. Okay? And now, nearly a thousand years later, Reason has made all its twists and turns, and finally it's proved inadequate right, to deal with man's deepest problems, okay? the greater questions. So now, but instead of turning to orthodoxy, right, all these people have plunged to a suicidal irrationality of all kinds, all kinds of irrational beliefs, all kinds of demonic beliefs. Cults, sects, heresies, ideologies are just, just now, at this point, a kind of a suicidal catatonia that most people are in. So they fell from that which is above nature, orthodoxy, right, to nature, which is the, the high humanistic culture of the, of the West, right? But now, what we see, but, but that couldn't last, right, because it's corruptible. So now it's fallen to a hatred of nature itself, a demonic hatred, a destruction of everything, what's could, what could be called nihilism, the philosophy of nihilism. So they fell from orthodoxy, which is divine truth, right, to creating a beautiful but a corruptible human culture, which is the, the high culture of the West, right, the Renaissance of, of uh, everything since then, the house high point is the 19th century, which seemed to be the triumph of the West, right, the 19th century, um, to the destruction of the West in the 20th century, and, and the concomitant philosophy of nihilism. And now we see the, the ethno-suicide of entire nations in a, in a demonic, they're in a demonic uh, frenzy. Of, of ethno, personal and ethno suicide, yeah, irrationality. Now, how did this get started? Yeah. So, now we're now entering the part of our course which is dealt with in Father Seraphim Rose's lectures. Tonight's lecture is dealt with in Lecture Two, the Middle Ages. Tonight's subject is dealt with in the Middle Ages. For those of you who want to study the transcripts of his lectures in tandem with our discussion, so I encourage everyone. My notes are, are brief. They're very they're very um, summary in nature. And uh, it would be helpful to listen, every, to get the most out of what we're doing. We should look at my notes, really listen to the audio, and then read Father Seraphim's notes. He's going to go on quoting some books at great length that we don't really have time for, and that we don't need to quote at great length. But I'm going to quote selectively from some of the things that he writes about. <clears throat> some things, rather, that he writes or that he quotes. Okay. Now, to, um, this lecture of Father Seraphim, Lecture 2, is divided into an introductory part and then four topics. He talks about scholasticism, romance, the new concept of sanctity, a person named Joachim of Flores, which is really, the topic is really chiliasm, utopianism and chiliasm, which Joachim of Flores is a prime representative in the Middle Ages. Okay. Art and politics. 
Actually, that's six topics. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know why I said four. Six topics. Art and politics. Remember, we talked. We had. We talked about these aspects of church life earlier, right? Theology, spiritual life, um, nation, art, and so forth. We're going to follow his outline, and tonight we're going to try to cover three topics. And even these three topics are too much for one night. It's classicism and romance and the new concept of sanctity. And what, in his introduction, Father Seraphim quotes from two writers, the 19th century Russian Orthodox Ivan Kidievsky, who with Alexei Khomyakov can said to be the founder of the Slavophile movement in Russia, and the Dominican modernist theologian Yves Kangar. Uh, briefly, um, Kirievsky and Khomyakov are key figures in 19th century Orthodox thought. Because in, in R Russia, and then uh, cultured Orthodox people in general, were bec uh, becoming enamored of Western ideas, Western thought, if Kirievsky and Homyakov were, were well-schooled in the Western European culture, and specifically in, in French and German philosophy, but they reacted strongly against it, and they became, especially Kirievsky, became a close disciple of the Optina elders, chiefly the elder Makari of Optina. And Kirievsky started both, both helping Optina to publish editions of the Holy Fathers of the Philokalia, and also writing philosophical and cultural articles in Russian journals, calling the Russian intelligentsia back to an orthodox worldview. But he knew they were captured by French and German philosophy in their thinking, and so he was using his knowledge, especially the German idealism, to bring, try to bring the Russian intelligentsia to repentance. Unfortunately, we know it, it was an uncompleted project. Um, and the intelligentsia and the Russian aristocracy led the way in the betrayal of the church and Sadr at the time of the revolution. But Kirievsky, but Kirievsky and Homyakov's work still stands as being very important. I was just reading, uh, re reading uh, the demons by Dostoevsky. By Dostoevsky, yes. He describes the process. Perfectly. The, the demons by Dostoevsky, are, it's usually in English it's called the possessed. The possessed. Uh, but it, the title in Russian is Bessie, is demons. And uh, Dostoevsky uh, uh, mag uh, masterfully paints this picture of what's going on in the Russian provincial cities at that time. It's, I think it's based on his experience in the city of Tver. He was part of it. Oh, he was part of it. Yeah, he was, he was, he was speaking from the inside, because in his early days, he had been part of the, one, of, one of these circles, revolutionary circles. But he was, God rescued him, and he was arrested and sent to Siberia. First, he was supposed to be shot. Yes, he, he was going to uh, see Tsar Nicholas. He, all the all the progressives hate Tsar Nicholas the first because he was an authoritarian. But, but if you read the life of, we're going to later on we talk about Russia. We're going to read about Nicholas the first, and how merciful he was, how kind he was even to his enemies, and he often would arrange for these young men to be frightened by being sentenced to death, but then being reprieved at the last moment. At the last moment, yes. <clears throat> To, to shake them, to, to bring them to their senses, to shock them into being thankful for their life, into reconsidering their life. And Dostoevsky really did. He, and he, he was sent to Siberia, and he really had a, a conversion back to orthodoxy. And all, all of his art after that point was in the service of trying to bring the, the Russian um, educated classes back into touch with orthodoxy. That doesn't mean that Dostoevsky is a theologian. He's, his thought isn't perfect, right? We can't follow him as a guide to orthodox theology. But as a guide to, to developing an orthodox heart, as a guide to understanding the illness of modern time, and a desire for orthodoxy, Dostoevsky is unsurpassed. He's, he's a great, great artist. And uh, I do recommend what's, what we need to do, what, what needs to be done, is that more of Kirievsky's work needs to be translated into English. Because Kirievsky is more of the um, philosophical foundation, whereas Dostoevsky is an artistic and imaginative and creative expression of, of what was going on, not only in Russia, but throughout the educated classes of all the Orthodox countries, was this struggle to say, well, okay, we've been educated by the West. We accept what's good from the West. We're not going to look down on their medicine. We're not going to look down on their science, you know, manufacturing, all these things. Uh, you know, if, if Russia had not adopted Amer uh, Western military science, they couldn't have defeated the Turks. They couldn't have defended themselves from the, from the Lutherans, from the Swedes. 
right? So we're not going to spit on everything coming from the West. That would be foolish, right? But we have to understand that for our fundamental belief in God, our faith, our worldview, our philosophy of who we are, who man is, what salvation is, we cannot go to the West. And we must, we must build an entire philosophy of life, everything. We must <coughs> reconsider everything in light of orthodoxy. And that has yet to be done. Our countries are still suffering from the uh, schizoid, the bicameral mind, you know. Our orthodoxy is in the monasteries, might be in the home, but it's not fully expressed in the institutions, in science, in education, in medicine, in manufacturing, and all these areas need to be converted, right, to an orthodox view. Um, and that, that is yet to be done. And part of our, like, what, we're having these kind of classes, and these kind of, this kind of discussions going on throughout the Orthodox world because we realize that this has to be done, right? If our people, our, our nations, our societies are going to be saved, right? <clears throat> so uh, Kirievsky traces the beginnings of the problems with the medieval schismatic papal church to a tendency in the West Roman mind they had from the beginning, remember? All problems uh, come, all problems that, that end up being big problems start with little problems. So all the Orthodox nations, they all have their strong points and their weak points. Okay? So the strong point of the West Romans, of, the, of old Rome, their strong points are they were orderly, they were rational, they were organized, they were very just. Right? But they were also not subtle like the Greeks. Right? They saw things externally. There were more emphasis, there were emphasis on external organization. Migratory tribes. Pardon me? The migratory tribes had the influence. Well, I'm going to get to that. Well, it starts with the Romans themselves, but then the, the tribes they conquer in the West, the German tribes, the Germans, uh, the, what became Western Christian culture is really a synthesis of the Western Roman culture and the Germanic culture. And the Germans, of course, even more than the West Romans, the Germans are very concerned with order and with, with, with ex the outward or external manifestations of life. Okay? And so they... This becomes, when they separate from orthodoxy, this becomes their entire approach. Thus creating this magnificent structure of the Western Church that we see, at least up till now, at least till, till they, they started demolishing it with Vatican II. They just, <laughs> the auto-demolition of the Roman Catholic Church we see now going on. But they created this magnificent structure, but the inner life was very confused. Right? It became very confused, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how their theology... And their this their concept of spiritual life became very, uh, very wrong, and and very very confused. Okay. So the Kirievsky sees that the Western mind is trusting too much in logical deduction, and valuing the external aspect of church over the interior aspect over the spiritual life. Right. But Congar, though his conclusion is not that the West should return to orthodoxy, but create a new theology. People like him are going to create a new theology, which we we've, we've seen by now where that where that's gone with the poor Roman Catholics. But a Congar did accurately identify what happened in the transition of the 12th and 13th centuries—a transition from theology based on a predominantly essentialist and exemplarist outlook to a naturalistic one, an interest in existence, and a transition from a culture where tradition reigned and the habit of synthesis became ingrained to an academic milieu, and where continual questioning and research was the norm. And analysis was the normal result of study. I'm going to read that whole quote from Congar. That's, it's amazing that a Western Dominican in the 20th century could identify so accurately what happened. Okay. Here's the whole quote. I'm quoting from Father Serfim's uh, notes. Mm -hmm. And here's this long quote from Yves Congar. In the period bet between the end of the 11th century, that is in the, in the year 1100, right, and the end of the, and the, end of the 12th, uh, 1200, a decisive turning point was reached in the West. It was a time characterized by several transitions. Uh, by the way, some historians call this the Proto-Renaissance or Proto-Humanism period, the 12th century. There was first the transition from a predominantly essential and exemplarist outlook to a naturalistic one and interesting existence. Let me explain that. So the traditional look, the, the traditional approach to life, as we talked about in our class much earlier on Orthodox theology, what, how the fathers did theology, right, is exemplarist, and it, and it, meaning there's an it, there's an archetype or a true type in the heavens, 
in, in, the, in the eternal world. That's the truth. And then everything in theology, both the Bible and all the written theology, and the art, and the hymns, and the preaching, mediate that eternal truth that's a finished, perfect archetype. And it's mediated to us through this transparent culture of the church. Which, again, again the, the, the keystone being the Bible and the Father's commentaries on the Bible, and then the hymns and the iconography and, and everything that goes into our Orthodox ethos, right? This comes, so it's transparent. So this, these archetypes, these eternal truths are mediated directly, but mis in, a, in a mysteriological fashion, right? Not in some kind of so-called scientific or mechanistic or materialist way, but in a, in a mystical way. They're mediated through the church directly to us. And our understanding of these things is synthetic. That is, it's whole. It puts everything together. And it makes us whole. It synthesizes our lives, our interior being. Right? Right? And when the fathers did analysis, they did it only as an auxiliary labor to defend the church from pagan philosophy or from secularist philosophy, from heretical ideas. It was a weapon they used, but it was not the, the primary way that, that the people experienced theology, or even the priest experienced theology. Okay. The priest experienced theology the same way the little old lady did in the church, through the services, through the Bible, through the icons, through the lives of the saints. And these divine realities were mediated directly to us, okay. or still are in the Orthodox Church. Right. But what happened? It's a transition from this uh, exemplar as I look to a naturalistic one, an interest in existence. Uh, this is a transition from the universe of exemplary causality in which the expressions of thought or of act receive their truth from the transcendent model, the archetype, right? ultimately God himself, right? <clears throat> which material things imitate, right? to a universe of efficient causality in which the mind seeks for the truth in things, in their empirical formulations. Why? What happened was they got so interested in the philosophy of Aristotle. They began to use Aristotle's epistemological approach to examine everything. Epistemology means how we know. So what does Aristotle say? Aristotle says all knowledge starts with sense experience. And we go, now Aristotle did believe in the universal, right? But he says we start with sense experience and we ascend to the universal. Now, there's no doubt that the mind does perform this function, right? When we're doing science or philosophy, the mind does, can start with sense experience and then abstract and form a concept of the universal. Okay? Which is, that's a legitimate insight of Aristotle. But the scholastics, or the, the, the Western thinkers of the Middle Ages started applying this method to everything and started saying that this is a more certain method of knowing than the direct the direct experience that we have in the church. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is this viewpoint is exemplified in the East by someone that we uh, that we anathematize every year in Orthodoxy Sunday and that we preach against on the second Sunday of Ortho the second Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of Great Palamas, who is Barlam of Calabria. And Barlam of Calabria, he was a Greek monk. He's from, he's from Calabria, from southern Italy, but that was really a Greek place. It was not really Italian, it was Greek. Mm -hmm. Barlam, Barlam comes to Constantinople, and he's fighting with St. Gregory, and he says that, you know, uh, scientific knowledge is more certain than spiritual knowledge. See, which obviously, I mean, he didn't, or Barlam would admit that he said that, but St. Gregory examined his arguments against the hesychasts, and he said the ultimate and St. Gregory pointed out to him, you know, the, ulti the ultimate conclusion of your way of approaching and saying that hesychasm isn't true and the prayer of the heart isn't true and the uncreated light isn't true, that the ultimate me well, your ultimate argument is really that, that uh, these syllogisms that you're learning from the Western theologians and the syllogisms of the pagan philosophers are more certain knowledge than the Father's experience of God. And St. Gregory was right. And Bar but Barlam's outlook, he was not alone. He was just expressing the ultimate uh, conclusion, the ultimate outcome of the Scholastics project. See? Um, so um, basically, let me go on. 
Basically, he, he says, was it not against this analytical athlete of, attitude of the Catholics that the Slavophile religious philosophy and his criticism of Catholicism in the 19th century? It's interesting. Kongar refers, is referring back to Komyakov and Kityevsky. But it's interesting that he didn't draw the conclusion. He didn't convert. Exactly. Right. So why? Because it's so obvious. She's in love with the world. Mm -hmm. Or whatever other reason. I, I think I've often told the story of my own <clears throat> mentor in, in college. He was a, a great intellectual, uh, a great scholar. He was taught in Europe by men like this, men exactly like this. He got his PhD at, in the, at the Sorbonne and was taught by men in this era, who came up in this era of Catholicism. And um, this professor demonstrated to me at every point how orthodoxy was right and Catholicism was wrong. And finally I said, Father, why don't you become Orthodox? And he said, ah, oh, I'm satisfied where I am. See, so, so ultimately people can know with their minds or, or their, their dialectical, or, or with, excuse me, with their um, discursive intellect, they can know that something's true, theoretically, but that doesn't mean they have to act on it, right? So, Coingar and his entire generation, all of these incredibly gifted men. But he did that. Oh, he, well, they acted to destroy their own church. They took all these tools, and they, they saw exactly where their church had gone wrong, and they said, aha, look, we went wrong, but they didn't say, well, that, so therefore, the conclusion is we must convert, we have to repent, we have to become orthodox. Their conclusion was, we have to destroy our church, and we're going to destroy the orthodox, too. So, so was not logical. No. It was not logical, was it? No, it was not logical. It was demonic. <clears throat> Obviously, it was demonic. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, the first topic then we're going to talk about is this scholasticism. Scholasticism is the name given to the philosophical and theological thought of men like Albertus Magnus and then preeminently his student Thomas Aquinas, Thomas of Aquino in Italy. Thomas Aquinas was an Italian, but most of his career was, was really centered around Paris and the, the great University of Paris in the period of the 12th to the 14th centuries, who applied the philosophy of Aristotle and the tools of dialectic to explaining and defending the theological and philosophical positions acceptable to the Western Church at that time. So Thomas Aquinas didn't say, aha, I'm going to destroy orthodoxy, right? Uh, he wasn't some villain with a black hat who went around trying to destroy orthodoxy. Thomas Aquinas was a person who sincerely wanted to defend, the, who believed, and he wanted to defend the teachings of his church, and he thought, and his teacher, Albertus, thought that Aristotle gave them these great tools to defend the teaching of their church. We have to realize that at the time, many church authorities in the West were against the scholastics. At the time, they were regarded as innovators. Okay. Because these authorities could see that these men were overemphasizing the use of reason, that this could lead to a break with tradition. Okay. Finally, however, the scholastics, having come close to being anathematized by the popes, were approved. And they went even for, and they even went to being the only acceptable explainers of the fathers. Now officially what we're going to what we're going to find out uh, as we go through this is that the official Roman Catholic position is one thing, but how they actually function is another thing. So the official Catholic position is that the fathers are higher than the scholastics. But in so many encyclicals the popes have said but you must always obey the scholastics in their interpretation of the fathers. Mm. So what they're saying is that only the scholastic method, they say, is, is proof against error. So you must follow the scholastics, especially Thomas Aquinas, who's regarded as, they call him the, the angelic doctor. Okay. So How people couldn't see it. Well, many people <coughs> did see it. Many people did see it. And one thing to understand is that church life in the West became bifurcated between the piety of the parish and the villages and the theology in the seminaries. It became a split see. So many, many uh, aspects of orthodoxy remain in the West, but they, but they are fragmented, and they're only experienced in, in a partial way, but mostly in the monasteries, in the, in the older monasteries, and the villages. But the newer orders, and the seminaries, and ultimately um, the authorities in Rome are living in a, in a, a, in a different mindset right, from the villages and from the older monasteries, the older monastic tradition. So it becomes fragmented. So what we see in the West is not total error. What we see is fragmentation. 
of the older piety remaining in many places but being mixed in with error and being crushed increasingly by by this uh, increasingly um, uh, hydrocephalic uh, headship of Rome which, which comes to almost to replace the church okay <clears throat> Now, a, a figure that Father Seraphim does not mention is that before, before the, the main period of scholasticism, before the so-called classic period of scholasticism in the 12th and 13th centuries, there's an earlier, very key figure. His name is Anselm of Beck. Of course, the Western Church calls him St. Anselm of Beck or of Canterbury, uh, who died in 1109. Uh, you know, we, uh, we Orthodox don't like him because the, the Normans brought him in to replace the old Anglo-Saxon uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, actually, he's the successor to the first Norman, I think. But he was run in by the Normans to be Archbishop of Canterbury. But he's from back. He's a Norman from France. Eventually, the, the great abbey of, at Beck in Normandy. And then later became uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. He died in 1109. But he, he writes, most Orthodox attack him because of his his treatise, Cordeo Somo, Why Did God Become a Man? Where he He's the one who elaborates or regular articulates the atonement theory of redemption, which we can talk about another time. <clears throat> but tonight, I want to talk about his proslogion, which is much more important for our purposes tonight. Um, <clears throat> he defines, he really redefines the goal of theological thought as in this famous expression, fides querens intellectum. Says the point of theological the theological effort of a theologian's work is faith seeking understanding. Because so I have faith, I have a blind faith in something. I don't know why I believe it. But I'm going to come to understanding. Okay. So instead of the mind, the intellectus, and intellectus means both understanding and mind. It's a play on words, you might say. So the mind seeking to know through faith through being transformed by God's word and by spiritual life, by the Holy Spirit, right? Faith is seen as somehow defective, lacking knowledge, and seeking more certain truth through intellectual effort. Is my faith, yeah, I believe in something, but that, that faith knowledge is kind of defective, it's kind of inferior. I need the higher knowledge that comes through using uh, reason to attain a higher, a higher understanding. And so this, this idea is really the basis of the whole modern era of faith versus reason, right? As if faith is blind and fundamentalistic and ignorant, right? And reason is higher. Reason leads to a higher knowledge. Okay? Now, Anselm would never have put it that way, right? Remember, he's a monk. He's going to church every day. He's chanting the Psalms every day. He believes, but he's making this subtle error in redefining what the project is that he's about. Now, now, of course, we all want to grow in our knowledge, right? We all say, well, I have faith, but I want to learn more about the faith. That's why I'm in, in a class. Okay. So there, there is a legitimate insight in that we, we want to understand our faith. But this formulation of fides quirens delectum becomes a basis of an entire shift in Western thought in which syllogistic reasoning mm -hmm. is seen as a, a surer guide to knowledge than the, than the synthetic perception of truth through the liturgy and through prayer, and through simply accepting the teaching of the fathers, and through reading the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> so we see this error uh, that <clears throat> Anselm sort of plants the seed of the error. Remember, in this period, we're just seeing the seeds of all the later errors. It's not the full-blown error. It's the seed of the error. Right? So, but, but we see this clearly exemplified um, in the 14th century then Barlam of Calabria, whom I've just mentioned. Okay. Now, Father Seraphim, in this lecture, in these notes, he goes into great detail about one of Aquinas' demonstrations. We don't need to spend time on that now. You can read that in the notes. He kind of, in a humorous way, he goes through one of these, one of Aquinas' demonstrations. By the way, if you read Aquinas, who is the greatest of the scholastics, it is an, an amazing intellectual achievement. And his method can be used. It's a, it's a useful method right, uh, for certain things, especially philosophical reasoning. But the important thing to understand for now is that for the Holy Fathers, Aristotle and Plato, all philosophical method 
or auxiliary to theology. The church's theology is revealed by God. It's testified to, it's witnessed by the apostles and the fathers and the saints. At the ecumenical councils, the Holy Fathers testified to what they had received. They didn't go to have logical arguments. They went to testify to what they'd received. And they, but when they needed, when they had to, when they needed to resort to using the language of the philosophers, they used it strictly in a limited way as a tool to bring out precisely and beautifully the tradition everyone already believed in. So it's a mistake. Sometimes uh, Westerners who don't understand, they, they know nothing about Constantinople. They know nothing about the Byzantines. They know nothing about the Greek fathers. They think that no Christians knew about Aristotle and Plato until the scholastics rediscovered it through the Arabs. Uh, that, that's, that's the whole, the, whole uh, the, the, politically, the pl politically correct belief today is that all Christians were ignorant of ancient culture and the Muslims rediscovered it and, and the translations into Arabic of Averroes and Avicenna of, of Aristotle revived culture in the West. All the Christians were ignorant, dark, and stupid. And then, uh, and then the scholastics uh, received Aristotle from, from the Muslims and gave rebirth to true learning in the West. Okay. And this totally ignores historical reality, which is that the knowledge, the very precise knowledge of Plato and Aristotle was completely there in Constantinople continuously. Right? The Greek fathers always knew about Plato and Aristotle. They didn't need to be taught by Arabs or, 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 or Aquinas or anybody else about Aristotle. If you read St. John of Damascus, his entire work, The, the, the Fount of Knowledge, uh, um, the, the third part of which everybody's familiar with, the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. Okay? But The Fount of Knowledge is really in three parts. The second part is a refutation of heresies. And it's often, that's, that's a very enjoyable part to read because it's often very humorous. St. John Damascus has a good sense of humor. So for making fun of Islam, it's wonderful. Um, and then, but the, the first part is St. John Damascus basically, uh, is basically his notes on Porphyry, um, who is one of the ancient expositors of Aristotle. Okay. St. John Damascus knew Aristotle backwards and forwards. And he uses Aristotle when necessary to make certain distinctions, or use certain, or employ certain terminology in his ex, in his explanation of orthodoxy. But he's using it very carefully, and he's using it sparingly as a tool. Okay. Now, what Aquinas does, and what Aquinas is doing, actually, Aquinas is actually the 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 climax, or the the most complete, and and by far the greatest example of a whole process that started in the, in the, with Anselm of Beck and then goes through the 12th century but leads up to Aquinas, who's the ultimate expression of this. What Aquinas does, what the scholastics do, is that they, they master the, 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 the philosophy of Aristotle and they master the art of dialectic. And they write these incredibly clever demonstrations of different, theologi different philosophical and dogmatic points. But they, they, but they're, what they're doing is they're encasing the theology in this expo in the explanation, right? And then the popes say that's the only possible explanation. You may only use their method, and you may only use their explanations. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what's w there's a subtle shift from trusting tradition and trusting the direct spiritual experience of the saints to trusting reason. Okay. But again, it's a subtle shift. So you hear some Orthodox say, oh, Aquinas, that's all stupid, that's all evil, and so forth. That, this, is, this is crude. You know, these kind of arguments don't work. Okay. The point is that there's a subtle shift, okay. but it's a very definite shift. Often in life, the most important changes are subtle changes, but they're very definite changes. It's a very definite change. And and this is why, and, and many wiser heads in the West saw this coming, and they argued, and they, they, they fought. They fought for Aquinas and a whole list of theologians of Paris to, to be anathematized. But it didn't work. They triumphed. See? Because the spirit of the age, the spirit of the times, was, was becoming humanistic. Was, they were enamored. The, the intelligentsia uh, were enamored of Aristotle. 
and they had lost touch with the East. You see, they, they had no living mm-hmm. contact, or very little living contact mm-hmm. with the Eastern Church. They already regarded as heretics. They were regarded as, as outside the church. And they could have, they could have been mm-hmm. humble and learned from the, the Greek fathers how to use Aristotle. But they had two problems. One was that they already looked down on the East, and the other was that they didn't have enough access to the Greek fathers. Their only father was Augustine, who himself didn't read Greek. He admitted his Greek was poor. And St. Augustine made up uh, an incredible corpus of writings using his own brain, his own reasoning, and using his own syllogisms in his own way back in the, in the late 4th and early 5th century <clears throat> to create a gigantic body of writings that the Western Church came to regard as the definitive patristic writings, even though he was only one person. And, he was, and they, couldn't, they couldn't correct St. Augustine by reading the Greek fathers. So they, Wait, they didn't translate it. It wasn't the big deal. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know the whole history of that. But this is yeah, your, fish, yeah. your son-in-law, Dr. <clears throat> Pitos, would know more about that than the, the exact the process by which the, the, the learning of the Greek fathers was really lost in the West. Um, so, so scholasticism becomes the only method of doing theology in the West, and uh, and it replaces, and it replaces the earlier uh, way of simply of of being immersed in. What was the earlier way of learning theology? Mm-hmm. Being immersed in the services, being immersed in the Bible, being immersed in reading the Fathers, being immersed in the life of prayer, and then having memorizing large memorizing vast amounts of the scriptures of fathers of the psalms of the services and then spun and then enlightened by the holy spirit then uh, spontaneously expressing oneself in in true theological terms which is still how real orthodox theologians write their theology they might or, they organize it of course on a topic as saint john of damascus did of course okay you can org- so it's it, it's in the orthodox theologians it's organized it's systematic but the but the the engine that makes it run is qu- completely different from this this uh, do, these syllogisms this vast uh, collection of syllogisms that the, that the scholastics have created and it shows in the personality of people well it, their character would also their character influenced their method, but also their method influenced their character. You mean people today? Oh, people today. <clears throat> yeah. Well, people today can't even do syllogisms, you see. But they went from, Western man went from trusting in reason to becoming totally irrational. See? Because um, if you trust in something, either, you know, reason, reason and logic are very good, right? They're from God, right? They're not evil, they're from God, right? But they have their place. And they have to be subordinated to the spiritual life, and to direct the direct revelation um, through mediated through through the church's sacramental life. But what happened was the scholastic syllogistic reasoning came to dominate the Western theology, and and then their spiritual life and their liturgical life became more and more truncated, desiccated, dried up. So that yeah, I, I go to my I go to my fifteen minute low mass in the morning, <clears throat> and I'm I'm done. You see, you know the, the the you know in the in the Middle Ages, the Western liturgies were just as long or almost as long as the Eastern liturgies. You know, the mass could take two or three hours because they had these beautiful traparia they would sing in between the parts of the mass and so forth. And in the sixteenth century, the Pope suppressed all this to make it more streamlined. You see, because they were at the end by the sixteenth century. They were so dominated by this um, reductionist approach to spiritual life. So why don't we need all those long traparia? Mm-hmm. Just cut it all, cut it all down. We're gonna, and, and why do we need the French doing it one way and the Italians doing it another way and these monks doing it their way? No, it has to be all the same. They level it all, they got rid of all the national traditions, and they truncated the services okay, to make it streamlined. They said they were doing it to fight Protestantism, you see, because the Protestants were complaining that the services are too complicated. So instead of just saying, no, they, they should be complicated because it's beautiful and it's, it's divine and, and we should enjoy it. They said, yeah, you're right. We're going to make everything short and everything has to be the way we do it in Rome. No more, no more English tradition, no more French tradition, no more Italian tradition, just our way. And all short. 
and they they just cut out. And in in the twentieth century, late twentieth century, musicologists and liturgical scholars have been going to the Vatican and to old monasteries, just uncovering just miles of manuscripts of beautiful old chants that are not used anymore because they just threw them out. Because they said, well, it's not necessary, right? Our theology says this is the minimum necessary for salvation. We're going to do this much. It became very rationalistic. Okay? Instead of just saying, this is the whole tradition of the church. We're just going to enjoy it. We're going to immerse ourselves in it. We're, we're going to love all these services. Um, their, their approach became... Uh, with, with this logic and with this rationalism, the approach became also reductionistic, right? reducing the life of the church to something, to a, a logical minimum. What do we need to be saved? X, Y, Z. Okay, we'll do that. Boom. Well, if people can't do that, well, we're lower, we'll, we'll just X and Y then. So finally, it's nothing. See? <clears throat> and that's what, unfortunately, that's what um, some people in orthodoxy want us to do. The services are too long. The fasting is too hard. Well, people can't do it. Well, we know people can't do it, but we have to keep it anyway. If you can't do it, be humble. Right? But we're not going to throw it out. Uh, but their approach came to be, we'll throw it out. It's not, you know, Aquinas has demonstrated we only need X, Y, and Z uh, for the sacrament to be valid. We only, we only need X, Y, and Z for the, con for the confession to be valid. Just do X, Y, Z. Don't worry about, don't, don't do all these other things that, your, that, that grandma did or that uh, the monks used to do. That's all, we don't need all that anymore. See, they started this idea a thousand years ago, but now our modern orthodox are, are saying these ideas. Um, so, going back to our friend Richard Weaver, uh, Richard Weaver's idea and ideas of consequences that the degeneration of the West starts in the 14th century with nominalism, which we'll talk about when we get to the 14th century. Weaver's, Weaver doesn't go deep enough he doesn't realize that the problems that the scholastics invited Occam's critique by leaving the security of holy tradition and the authority of the fathers for the uncertain project of dialectical criticism of all the church's teachings. They open up the door. Once you start the dialectic, what is dialectic? I make a thesis, you make an antithesis, we arrive at a synthesis. It becomes an endless process right, of dialogue. So I, whenever I hear about, I, there, we need to have a dialogue, I might cringe. <laughs> they don't have these dialogues, and the ecumenists have all these dialogues, have these dialogues. Well, that, that's because once you start the dialogue, it never stops, right? And uh, you never arrive at anything, or, or rather things get, keep getting reduced and reduced to, to the to point where there's nothing. Okay? Once you start that dialectic, the horse is out of the barn. You can't, you can't stop that process. So, so it's, one of those, it's one of those turning points in history where you say, why did God let that happen, you know? But of course, in his wisdom, he doesn't stop man from making mistakes if man's determined to make a mistake. So the, those Western authorities could have stopped this, and they were trying, some of them were trying very hard to stop this, but it happened. And the, the scholastic method became dominant. Okay. Uh, Father, Father Seraphim's next topic is romance. The high Middle Ages, that is the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, see the beginnings of romantic literature, the romantic ideal. Until then, in Christian literature, you didn't really see what you would call romance, romanticizing life, romanticizing the saints, romanticizing um, heroes, and so forth and so on. But in the, in, the, in the West, around the time of the schism, and right after the schism, you see this explosion of romantic literature, the French chanson, like the chanson de Roland, um, all, the whole, all the whole cycle of Arthurian literature. Arthur is a British character, but the French in the Middle Ages take the character of Arthur and they create this whole romantic cycle of stories and poems about his knights and so forth. The mystery plays. The mystery plays are the beginning of the transition from liturgy to theater. Okay, so what are the mystery plays? The, um, they're plays that be, be performed in church about a spiritual topic or a, 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 um, a scriptural story or life of a saint, but they'd make a play out of it, and they do it in the church. No, no, in the Orthodox church. Yeah. Well, if you want to do it as a children's as a children's activity in the parish hall, that could be a nice educational experience, right? But this became, this is a quasi liturgical thing that they're doing in the church, replacing, replacing the liturgy. You see. And but the beginnings of modern theater, because the fathers and the emperors had suppressed theater. Right, theater was done. They because theater, like the Olympic Games, theater was seen as an 
as a ritual, which it was in, in ancient Greece and Rome, it was a it was a sacred ritual dedicated to the pagan gods. Sports. And, yeah, yeah this, the the all the the games and theater, right? Were were bound up with 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 um, the worship of the gods. And also, theater was bound up with immoral lifestyle, which is the way. The canons say you may not be an actress. Why? Because actors are also prostitutes. Right? Um, so we have in the West, in the Middle Ages, after the schism, is the rebirth of theater in the. But they could. They weren't going to just jump right into theater. They were too. They were too religious to do that. They had. They had the, the mystery plays. Okay. But the mystery plays. What well, the mystery plays now? Fantasize and romanticize the sober subject matter of the scriptures and lives of the saints. Okay. It's a again. It's a subtle shift. It's it's not done uh, in an ugly, body way. It's done in a very respectful way, but it's still that shift, right? To 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 the overuse of imagination and emotion, rather than sobriety, sobriety of prayer. Okay. <clears throat> and also, there are the romantic ideas about chivalric love. What what chivalric love? What what is chivalry? Chivalry is from the French. Uh, uh, Cheval horse or chevalier, a horseman, a knight, right? So, what was the, the Western Church had a problem? You know, these barbarians converted to the faith. They had very barbaric ideas about war, about family life, and so forth and so on. They were a bunch of warriors. They were a bunch of illiterate warriors who necessarily led a, led a, had a very rough life. They they existed by fighting, just to preserve their land, to preserve their families, and to preserve their their people. But um, they were they were they were kind of bloodthirsty, and so the the Western Church had to make a very strong effort to to transform these people into good Christians. <coughs> so they had one practice was a very good practice called the Peace of the Church. On certain days of the week, and and all the feast days, they were forbidden from fighting, and they for the most part they listened because the Church's authority was very great in the in the West as well as in the East. But also, they developed this idea of, of, of chivalry, which is uh, to, to sublimate the warrior's energies, or his, to, 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 to make a good use of his thimos, of his ambition, of his, of his excitable power, his anger, into something higher, a noble ideal of dedication to fighting for God, which is where the Crusades come from. Right? Deus vult, God wills it. We're going to go and fight for Christ, you see. But also, there's this idea of chivalric love. The idea of chivalric love as a romantic idea that there's... Okay, this sounds very strange to us, but this is the way it works. There's your wife, you're married to her, and you're loyal to her according to the laws of the church. But there's another woman who's your romantic ideal, and she's another, another man's wife, and you romanticize her and you idealize her as your feminine ideal, and, you, and you go, when you go to tournaments or you go to war, you fight for her, for her honor. So it's very strange, right? It, it's uh, to us that's that's extremely strange, right? But for th for them, it was a way of fantasizing about an ideal love and sublimating their their sexual impulse into some kind of idealistic love for some woman whose ideal of beauty. In the, the most famous example is Dante's Beatrice, right? Dante in 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 the Divine Comedy, Dante writes about. Uh, or is always thinking about Beatrice, who's his ideal love. He's a woman he's not married to. She's another man's wife. And she's his guide to paradise. In the third part of the Divine Comedy, when he goes to the Paradiso, when he goes to, he's shown the, he's shown the uh, heaven and, and uh, the earthly paradise and then the, the levels of heaven, Beatrice is his guide. See? So it's, it's a mixing up. It's a confusion of love for a woman with love for God with um, a, a confusion of, of the sexual impulse and uh, really a earthly affection or emotional love with spiritual love. We see this bearing bitter fruit later on in Roman Catholic spiritual writing and spiritual experience, which we'll, we'll get to later on. We get to the medieval uh, and, and the Renaissance era mysticism. Okay. <clears throat> so what's going on here? They're getting mixed up. Okay. They're getting mixed up. They're... They're, they're leaving the safe path of the fathers and getting into the realm, overemphasizing their emotions and their imagination, and even their, even their sexual impulse. And they're mixing this all up with Christianity and with theology. Okay. 
Um, in the church literature, Father Seraphim talks about the Golden Legend. The Golden Legend is a collection of the lives of the saints, but it's utterly fantastic. Some medieval writers introduced all these incredibly fantastic uh, or, or fairy tale kind of features to the lives of the saints, which is why later on in the Renaissance, <coughs> there are important <coughs> scholars, including famous cardinals, who just cut out huge parts of the lives of the saints. Just like, just like they threw out a lot of relics. Why? Because the Middle Ages, they had falsified so many relics. They'd also falsified so many lives of saints. So they had a reaction. The other way, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. And so it's, its logical conclusion is today, when the popes say, you don't, don't even believe that St. George existed. Don't even believe that St. Barbara existed. See? So they had these abuses that the Orthodox didn't have, but they reacted to them by throwing everything out, See, which is what happens. That's what happens in human life. If you have an abuse of something and you don't do it properly, it, sometimes it gets thrown out and the, and the good gets thrown out with the bad. Um, so I mentioned the Golden Legend as an example of this romantic literature. Now, that leads us to the new concept of sanctity. The first and greatest example of this, of romanticism in spiritual life is Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi is the, really the re-founder of the Western Church. The entire concept of spiritual life, the entire concept of living the gospel changes by this. Francis of Assisi is more important than Aquinas. He's more important than Pope Innocent III. He's more important than any of these people. Because uh, what's important in the church is what is the model, what is a saint? What's the model of sanctity? And for the second millennium, Francis of Assisi sets the stamp. From what then on, from all time in the Western will be regarded as what is a saint. Okay. Francis claims to have received a revelation which commanded him to create an entirely new kind of monastic life, not bound by the tradition of the fathers, not, not referring to the Desert Fathers, not referring to St. Basil, not referring to St. Benedict, or any of the Western monastic <clears throat> fathers. Because Francis, like Aquinas, Francis was brought before the authorities to say, what are you doing? You're saying your monks don't live in monasteries, they wander around, they just beg. St. Benedict in his rule says, you're called a Jaravig, that's the worst kind of monk. That's a Western rule. Of course, St. Benedict is referring back to St. Basil and John Cash and all the Eastern Fathers. But his monks were roaming around, they didn't work for a living, they just begged. They were kind of, he calls them, he calls them like troubadours. A troubadour was the French, you know, a musician. Troubadours for Christ. <clears throat> they're beautiful, they're wandering around, talking to the birds, and, and you know, they're, they're kind of fake fools for Christ, but it's highly emotional, it's highly romantic. Okay? And, um, and they're amazing everybody, they're, by their lyrical, emotional, enthusiastic love for everybody. And they're doing all kinds of extreme asceticism, showing off their asceticism. Father Seraphim talked about one time where uh, Francis ate meat. So he said, oh no, I've eaten meat. I'm so evil. Come and pour dung over my head in public. Okay, uh, uh, this exaggerated, uh, self-centered repentance. Okay, very romantic, uh, very, very, really, I hate to use a modern psychological term, but almost, you would say, narcissistic. Um, He's obsessed with himself, right, and his emotions and his experience of love for Christ. And it gets so bad that he has the hubris to ask to receive the physical wounds of our Lord on his body. This is never seen before. For a thousand years, the church produced thousands of monastic saints. They never, ever asked or never showed or the wounds of Christ would appear on their bodies. And the stigmata. Right. Uh, this is the origin. Francis is the first stigmatist. Okay. So he's on uh, a mountain. I forget the name of the mountain in Italy. Mount, I think it's Mount Averno. And he's praying, and he says, oh, I want to receive the wounds of Christ. And a fiery seraphim appears and shoots rays at him at the point of the body where our Lord was wounded. And he starts bleeding. And since then, in the Western Church, we've had periodically these stigmatists. And it, it's real. You should have been so a lot. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, the most... Uh, the most self-inflict their wounds? No, no, they just appear. It's from the demons. Yeah, it's preternatural. It's not... It's Some people say, well, it's just a psychological... They, 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 they're so psyched out about Christ's sufferings that it just... It's a psychosomatic phenomenon. Well, obviously there's a psychosomatic element, but the demons must be involved, right? It's so... It's so obviously a form of delusion... Right? But it's so sad because when you read about these people, 
you have to sympathize because they have very terrible lives. Uh, um, there's one in the, the 19th century, Catherine Emmerich, on, and she had a terrible life. She was bleeding almost constantly for her entire adult life. And, but, but God, quote-unquote, the Lord, quote-unquote, consoled her by giving her a fantastic vision, she had books and books and books of visions where she claimed to, to go back in time, so to speak, and see exactly what happened at Noah, what happened with Abraham, uh, whole conversations the Holy Mother of God had with different people. Just obviously, I mean, those of us, even us, we're simple Orthodox, right? We, we just know Orthodoxy 101. But even with Orthodoxy 101, we can look at that and say, well, that's just delusion. Now, how come this happened just in Catholic yes. Church? Yes. I haven't seen, I haven't heard. Of such a yeah. thing? Yeah. Of course not. And even in, and in the Western Church, you never heard of such a thing until after the schism. Mm -hmm. You look at the first thousand years in the Western Church, no Western saint. St. Leo the Great, St. Benedict, St. Gregory the Great, no Western saint ever had this. This is something not Western, this is just demonic. Right? But it's wrapped up with this ro now romanticizing of the relationship with God. Right? Something highly emotional, even quasi-sexual relationship with God. And it is, it's really demonic. So you see the beginning here of the whole Western Church getting unmoored, unanchored, right, from the safe harbor of the teaching of the fathers about sobriety, about true prayer. They're launching out into this dangerous sea of emotionalism, right, and fantastic, imaginative, and sometimes really carnal experiences, right, taking as, taking as, as genuine spiritual experience, okay. The problem is when you're talking to a sincere Catholic, if you say, well, you know, Francis isn't really a saint, or Teresa of Avila isn't really a saint, they get very upset, because you've, you've, these are, the, these are the nice people, these are the conservative people, right? They love their church, right? They love their saints. And so you can't start with that. You have to teach them about the true teaching of the fathers and hope that it, and then kind of lead them and say, you know, now what do you, now that you know the teaching of the fathers, what do you think about Francis? What do you think about um, Teresa of Avila, or Teresa of Lisieux, and so forth? Um, because these are very, on the human level, these are very highly attractive personalities. They're not ugly, mean people doing wicked things, right? They're very attractive person, but it's but it's a it's a purely earthly attraction. It's not spiritual. So it's very very dangerous. A very bad thing is that there are Orthodox who venerate Saint Francis, okay. and there are even Orthodox so-called Orthodox monasteries have icons of Francis, and this is very bad. It's it's it's, it's very dangerous. So um, we see that now, so what do we have? By the end of this period, we have a very intellectualized, very rationalistic theology. On the one hand, unmoored from the fathers and from tradition, right? They claim to, be lo they claim to love tradition. Aquinas would be horrified if you said he, he didn't respect tradition. Right? I mean, he read, the, he read the Psalms every day. He chanted the office every day. Um, he, he was reading the fathers. Okay? He was going. To, he was doing the services every day. He wasn't. We, we have to. We have to see things from his his point of view. He's. He feels very secure in the tradition, but he's inventing this entire weapon <laughs> that ultimately destroys the trust in tradition and replaces it with trust in reason. Okay? So we have this very rationalistic theology, and we have a very emotional, fantastic romantic spirituality already by the end of the 13th century. And it's just going to get worse. Okay. So um, next week we'll talk about the art and um, we'll talk about politics. I don't want to go too much into Joachim of Flores. You can read about it in Father Sarah uh, we'll, we'll summarize that briefly. He goes on and on about Joachim of Flores. He's obviously very interested in this. Because Father Sarah is very interested in eschatology. That's why he translated Vladika Verki's commentary on the Apocalypse. Um, but we'll, we'll talk mostly about, we'll try to confine our talk next time to the art, talk briefly about what happens to the art and arch architecture, <coughs> and then the, the, and the, the shift in the relationship of the church to the emperor, how that really shifts in the West, from being symphonia to being a competition between the Pope and the emperor. And this is what tears apart, tears apart Western Europe, and ultimately leads to the, the fragmentation of, of a, the Christian nations.